Thanks for uh, joining in the next in the Sydney Institute series, virtual series of speeches. And today we have Jean Kitson, who is well known to most of you, I suspect. But I'll introduce her briefly. She's an author, a public speaker, an actor, a comedian, a scriptwriter for stage, television, theatre, and radio. Her first book is You've, you, You're Still Hot to Me. And her most recent book is We Need to Talk About Mum and Dad, which is her second book. And that's what Jean Kitts will be talking about today. Um, we'll have a talk, and then Anne Henderson will do a lead a question discussion period. Uh, and then that's over. And I just want to say thanks to uh, our members who are sending questions today, and Anne will use some of those. And the topic for today is A Practical Guide to Parenting Our Aging. Parents. Jean, thank you. Thank you, Gerard, and good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be here, and I'd like to thank the Sydney Institute for inviting me to speak about my new book. I wrote We Need to Talk About Mum and Dad because I've been trying to help my parents as they aged for some years, ever since they became closer to 90 rather than 80, and our journey together to find the right things to do to help them, the best place to live, the most appropriate care and assistance, the most suitable medical attention, was difficult and confusing and complicated and it was fraught with frustration and fear. And there seemed a lot more pain than gain. I thought it was just us, actually, until I realised it wasn't. And I go through it all again in my book so that you won't have to. My, I thought I was asked because my family are not particularly good about talking about difficult subjects like sickness and dying and death. And I assumed that it was this sort of reluctance to talk to each other that caused their life to, be, to seem to be always teetering between um, managing and disaster, between chaos and control. But while I was touring and talking about my earlier book, We Need to, uh, You're Still Hot to Me, The Joys of Menopause, I met a lot of other women my own age, and they were going through menopause, they had children still at home, they were still working full time, and they were trying to do the best by their aging parents. And it was their elderly loved ones and how to help them that was the most fraught, that was causing them the most sleepless nights, not the hot flushes or the HSC. And I thought, why, why is ageing so difficult? Why is it so fraught? Why are so many of our elderly loved ones so unhappy? And why are so many of our families so anguished about our parents? Why is there so much grief and anxiety and remorse and regret and guilt. You know, has it always been like this? We all think we know what to do when the time comes, and there are many times that do come between aging and frailty and helplessness and death. But we don't really know, it's always difficult, and love is not enough. We really all need to know, you know, what to do, and we need to know what to say even. But the truth is that while we may banter about ageing, it is quite likely that most of us don't actually know what that means. What happens when we become parents of our parents? What kind of help will they need? How can we help them without making them feel helpless? How can we avoid treating them as if they are helpless? And the problems are not just the practical difficulties of working out what it is they need and then sourcing it and putting it in place. But the unpredictable problem is when your parents arc up and constantly resist what they obviously need. Sometimes it feels as if you are forcing your parents to look after themselves. For example, my parents have not once in their collective 185 years gone to a doctor just for a checkup. They need to have an actual arrow through their leg and a boa constrictor wrapped around the other one before they see a doctor. People like my dad believe that if you fall into the hands of doctors, they will find something wrong with you. 
the way unscrupulous mechanics do when you take in your car. And if there is something wrong, he would rather not know, even if the diagnosis could improve his well-being. A few years ago, my dad was diagnosed with some heart condition. I, came, I went to see them and mum said, oh, your dad has to have a balloon put up the artery in his groin and then it'll go further up and open up the arteries for, you know, further up in his body. And I said, oh, right, dad, okay. Well, let me take you to the specialist. And dad said, okay, I'll let you know. And I said, well, when's your appointment? He said, I'll let you know. And then a month passed and I saw dad again. I said, so dad, when's your appointment? And he said, it's all right, you know, it's in a month or so. Well, when exactly is it? And he said, I'll handle it. I went, okay. And so then I decided to ring the specialist. And I rang up the specialist to ask where my dad's appointment was. And the receptionist said, oh, Roy. She said, oh, no, his friend Bert rang and said that he was all better now. And he cancelled the appointment. My father has an invisible friend, a new one, and he is very cunning. My first tip is that we need to talk about mum and dad with mum and dad in the room, at, a, at the round table. You've got to put them at the centre of all conversations and listen to them. Ask your parents what they want, what they hope for, and what are their fears. It may sound obvious, but many of us make decisions about our parents without involving them, even if they're sitting in the same room, simply because we've raised children or pets or we've run a chain of major florists and we think we really are very good problem solvers and also we don't want to bother mum and dad. They, we don't want to bother them about them. So don't think like this or they will form a resistance movement. See Bert, and it's not the first time I might add it about Bert. And, and it's rightly so. And please keep in mind that all my advice in the book comes from me not having the book to give me advice. So I have made so many mistakes. For another example, one of the first things we wanted our parents to do was consider moving from the family home. This is how it happened. My mum, legally blind and loudly deaf, and dad, two new hips and a couple of health issues which are unresolved because he won't let bloody doctors anywhere near him, were still holding themselves together, but their house wasn't. It had this upstairs balcony which was held on by two loose bricks and was ready to plummet into their little pool because Dad was either fixing one or cleaning the other, or both, and there were a few things they could simply not do anymore, and riding an avalanche was one of them. And so naturally, their three devoted children came up with three completely different solutions to the challenges of ageing. Plan A was my sister's. Her plan was that mum and dad should remain at home for as long as possible with home help for cleaning and shopping and their health and regular visits from us to make sure that they were coping mentally and physically. Plan B was provided by my brother who lives in Melbourne. He barely arrived before mum and dad were bundled into his car and taken on a little drive to look at some attractive retirement villages. Plan C was mine. This is where we turn the spacious old garage cave under the house into a delightful open plan apartment or granny flat which is easily the size of their present living room so that mum and dad could throw away nine tenths of their possessions and furniture and move in with us. And as you will have guessed, these well-meaning solutions were met with a mixed response, best expressed by my father saying bluntly, when did you children start taking an interest in us? Which is actually and factually unfair but I did understand his tone. Because every time the family tried to objectively plan what was best and lay out the options, it sounded more and more like an ultimatum. You know, put down the spanner, keep your hands where I can see them and move into the spare room now. <laughs> if your parents are reluctant to discuss important topics, important documents, important medical considerations, important financial questions, yada, yada, yada. 
you need to constantly reassure them that it will give them more control in this stage of their lives, not less. And it really will. It'll give them more control. They will be, they will have everything in place and they will know where everything is and how everything works. And mind you, you have to get in early but because as my mum says, the last five years of your life are like the first five years. Everything changes so quickly and she hasn't even seen Benjamin Button. And she said that ten years ago, I might add, and still counting. So, but please, you know, seize the day. Every time I tried to help my parents, it would take me months to find out what was needed and then months to find out how to access the right help and then months to put it in place and in the meantime we had all got to another stage and discovered another problem that needed a whole new set of solutions. In the time I started worrying about my parents, which could have been a little premature, I think Dad was about 75, which sounds quite young to me now, that was about 20 years ago, but in that time, between them, they have had a broken hip, a broken shoulder, a broken femur, two strokes, prostate cancer, two heart events, various skin cancers and chronic wounds, and both have lost their sight. My mother is legally blind, and my father uses a jeweler's loop to peel the potatoes. True. They have gone from being mobile and driving to both of them uh, pushing frames. They have been to hospitals and rehabs and transition care and seen specialists and GPs and made the huge decision to sell the family home and move into a unit in a retirement village. They started with one hour cleaning a week and now they have, now they're on home care packages of a level two and a level three. They've got about 12 hours of services a week which include, excuse me, They've got about 12 hours of services a week, which include cleaning and shopping and cooking and personal care, which all have their associated challenges managing that. They have also had to put in place enduring powers of attorney, enduring guardianships, a will and an advanced care directive, an AD. Um, and these are big changes. These are big changes at any age. Try to imagine changing the lot, the whole of their living arrangements. And we have to help them manage that. Whether they like it or we like it or not, we do. We have to help the older people in our lives, our parents, our grandparents, aunts, uncles, and any other elders within the radius of our family, our community, and our affections. Time and again, in all the interviews I did with um, people, partners, offspring and professionals, the common cry was, I pity the older person who doesn't have an advocate, who doesn't have kids or a trusted person to look after them. To quote one person's informed outburst, God, I mean to try to have a go at the system on your own when you were sick and old. I think about that all the time. If an elderly person tried to manage the systems and bureaucracies and legalities, Centrelink, the medical system, moving into aged care, applying for home care packages, ACAT, it's a whole other language. If they, tr if they tried to do any of that themselves, they would have no chance, no chance at all. You may very well be their number one essential service because the world is impatient with old people and this includes all the departments and organisations which are for old people and very often you are their only defence. The last time my mum was transferred into rehab after a broken hip, the people in the rehab were surprised when she told them she couldn't walk. My mother said, the hospital misled them. They said I could walk. Anything to get rid of the rubbish. And I am rubbish. How has this come about? Is it because ageing is now often seen as a problem? It's a problem for the community and families, apparently. It is no longer just a part of the natural order of things. We separate our elders from ourselves and our communities. 
we shift them to places where they can be with each other and not with us. So we can pop in from time to time when we have time and we outsource their care. Now this may merely be the new natural order. All these developments may not be bad. Experts keep telling us so. But if they're not, not bad, then why do so many of us feel so uncomfortable about the direction we are heading? Let's start with this idea. Old people are not a burden. They're not a burden to us as individuals or family. They're not a burden to our communities. They're not a burden to our economy, and they're not a burden to our country. They are people who will be us in the blink of an eye, and we won't be a burden either. They are people who have added their humanity to the continuum of life, to the collective consciousness of our community, and also to our gene pool, who have added their words and deeds to the fabric of our communities, along with their productivity and their taxes. Nor are old people a homogenous group. More often than not, all they have in common is their age. They are individuals with their own stories and their own thoughts and their own feelings. And because they have more experience and experiences than their juniors, they ought to be listened to rather more and dismissed rather less. What most of us want for our ageing loved ones is to be able to smooth their path, to make sure that their later years are peaceful, pleasant and pain free. Above all, we want them to remain connected with our lives, connected to our lives and the lives of their familiar communities, for their lives always to have meaning for themselves and for others who know and love them. We want to support our parents to enjoy this stage of life, the third age as many marketers call it. To do that, we need to know what we can do to help our elders to live the best life they can. What is best for them, not best for our health system or our economy or our government or us and our frantically busy and essential lives. In my book, I've tried to include most of the things you need to know, including all the things that you didn't know you need to know. Did I mention my number one tip, actually? Get a notebook, a big one, a large one. Write everything down, every call, every appointment, every shift in priorities, every line of inquiry. Unless you have total recall, you will need it. And remember where you put it. <laughs> this is no time to be having senior moments yourself. Thank you. Gee, that was fantastic. Um, having read the book, which I did in about a weekend, I've decided that this is the Bible that not the children need to have by their bed, but the, the parents need to have. <laughs> Thank you so much. Because really, it may, I don't have any parents alive anymore, and I did have a mother that had to go into care in Victoria and I was in Sydney, but I've been through some of what you've been through, but not nearly as much because she didn't get to that frail estate. But I saw it purely from the person that I am getting to that, moving into that phase. This is the advice I need so that my poor children don't have to go through what you went through. But in all of this, what comes out is your sense of humour, apart from you know, the, the seriousness of what you... It is a serious book. But, and the Patrick Cook cartoons are just marvellous. They complement everything. But what comes out is your respect, which many of the younger generation for their aging parents, they get beyond it. They somehow or other don't spend the time and they don't have it. And I think your use of the word elder rather than elderly underpins all of that. But to what extent, and you say the family is the big thing, <laughs> what difference does having that family mean? You're saying, you know, if you don't have a family, God help you. Yeah. But there's an awful lot of problems by just having a difference of opinion in the family. So what's your feeling about family? Yes, family can be really difficult. I've spoken to so many people who the conflict that around family, that didn't happen in my family. My family's perfect, and all the siblings get on 100%, and yeah. we never argue. Not I just that. want to put that <laughs> on the table. 
but it can be a real problem with siblings. There's always different. In fact, there are different forms of siblings. There's the, you know, the CFO who gets everything done and organises everything. That's often the oldest daughter, but in my case, it's not. It's my <laughs> younger sister. I don't know how that works, but she does most of it because she works in. Uh, with disabilities, yeah. so she knows about bureaucracies and Centrelink and organising yeah. home care. And then there's the FIFO, which is a fly in, fly out, you know, offspring, son or daughter who flies we in, all have that. bangs the drum, says, What are you doing to mum? This needs to happen, you know. And then upsets everyone, rocks the boat, and then, and then flies off home. again. And then there's a the bad sibling who nobody likes to talk about. And um, there's a great example of a bad sibling in the book when mm. I was told where um, uh, this accountant friend of mine said he was rung by this particular son saying, oh, my mother's just died, you know, have you got her will? He was the executor of the will. And he said, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. He was a friend of this woman. He'd been her accountant for years. And he said, I'm really sorry to hear that. Yes, I'll go and find the will, I'll get back to you. But he's a very savvy person, he does his due diligence, he rings up the daughter and he said, I'm so sorry to hear your mum's died. And she said, I'm at the bedside, she died five minutes ago. <laughs> That's a bad sibling. Really cruel, isn't it? Just it's going really straight, to the, really straight nice. to the will. So, um, but there are ways that families can, without you know hiring an MMA referee or a high court judge, there are ways get to it. There are people who know how to do this, how to, there's steps that did, you can go through in. You did know. different members of your family over the experience start to become more able to work together? Oh yes, yeah. yeah. So, and then that experience leads to the book. So how much, you, how, how important was your notebook when you wrote the book? Oh, extremely important. <laughs> I love Everything was in there. Everything. When you ring up Centrelink, because as you get older, you, you are going to, most people are going to have to be in, be in touch with bureaucracies. They're going to have to register for um, a home care package or a, get an assessment by aged care. So some people for the first in their time in their lives have to ring Centrelink and that, that could be... Can oh, that's be the a most terrible experience. Yeah. The first time. So there, are, <laughs> so there are really great tips. One, ring before 10 o'clock. Two, when they give you a reference number, write it in your notebook, tattoo it on your forehead, name your pet after it. That reference number is everything. You do not want to lose the reference number of your phone calls. And then when they suggest a form that you have to fill in, write down the number of the form because there are hundreds of forms that are very similar. And this can go on for months and months. So there is, there's some really good tips I've got from people on how to manage all these things. because. People have done it and survived. <laughs> you know, just and again, it takes an enormous amount of time when people are working in careers. You know, if yeah. you're in your fifties or something, it's how do people find the time? Well, it's really hard. You have to carve out time, and if you think something's going to take an hour, it'll usually take three hours. Yeah. You can't just rush your parents. You can't no. bundle two two people on friends into a car, rush them to an appointment and think you're going to go in and be out in an hour. That just doesn't happen. You need to find the time. And a lot of people who work in aged care have said slowing down and just, you know, being, taking the time it needs is a really good thing to, you know, for them, for yourself. And I think a lot of people are finding that with COVID now and the lockdown, mm -hmm. just how revved up we all got, mm -hmm. how many deadlines we would put into a day, how many missions we would go to in the car or how much work we would cram in. So just taking a bit of a breather and it's hard to organise, especially if you've got And you have to sacrifice and, something in your own life, presumably, to do that. Of course, and, and it's not really sacrifice. It's like people who ask women, you know, who have babies, or oh, what did you, did you sacrifice your work? Well, you don't really sacrifice anything. You just have different priorities mm. and you make different decisions. Mm. So you're not giving something up. You're making something more important. Yes, and, and it's... And it's and you, be, you know, it is more important yeah. and it gives you a great deal of satisfaction being able to help your parents and keep them um, engaged and healthy. Did your, your parents are in care now? No, they're, they're still independent. They're still managing? They're independent, they have um, people come in yes. regularly, mm -hmm. 
and mum has just started having someone come in and give her a shower because dad wasn't managing his, I'm afraid. But they're, they're, they're not with the balcony that's about to fall in the pool. No, they, they sold the house and they moved to a retirement village, okay. as my brother wanted. Yeah, <laughs> it's, that's right. He's so, got his way. So what, what would you advise about, there are various, various professionals that go, you go through, there's lawyers. There's doctors, there's finance advisors, there's bureaucracy, Centrelink. Advice, lawyers, what's an advice about lawyers? Because you obviously met some shocky ones. Yes, I did, actually. Actually, um, and I didn't realise they were shocking until after we made all the mistakes. I, I, I was researching the book and someone was talking about enduring powers of attorney and I went, what's an enduring power of attorney? I said to mum, uh, you know, I'm your power of attorney and then I realised there were all these different powers of attorney. And you actually need someone to be an enduring power of attorney in case you, and you need to put that in place before you lose the capacity to make those decisions. So you have to decide who is going to be your major decision maker. And an enduring power of attorney, um, it's different in every state, so I'm not going to try mm. and, and tell you what exactly it is, because I suggest that you get a really good solicitor and a, someone who's used to doing this, doesn't take a long time, someone who's used to doing wills, not, not someone who goes, oh, and I do you know, estate planning and wills, someone who does wills all the time will make sure your will is right, enduring power of attorney, enduring guardianship, because in some states an enduring power of attorney can decide what medication you're on, but can't decide what medication you're allowed to stop, you need, and you know, it's complex. Yeah. Then you've got your advanced directive, which takes the weight off everybody's shoulders when we know what our parents want, how far they want to go, mm. how much intervention they want. In most cases, you're going to have these remarkable, amazing palliative care mm. um, prof prof specialists yes. looking after them, and that team will give you the right thing to do and guide you. But at the, but at the same time, if your family is given a choice and you don't know what your parent mm. would want, that's really hard. Hard to find out. Yeah. Yes. Mm. And in terms of um, bureaucracy, how you deal with finances, there are people who have later life finances and they're not expensive and every part of aged care has a financial component. Mm -hmm. You must know exactly where, you, where you, your loved ones stand mm -hmm. financially, mm -hmm. because you know, because, and a financial expert will tell you that immediately. Mm -hmm. Because if you even qualify for you know one one dollar of the pension, you're, you, that opens up it's like about forty nine different yeah. subsidies and All the concessions. Things you get from the government. Yeah. yeah, and it also accesses you to care mm -hmm. and the right care and the right help and. And also you need to understand your finances because even if you're not accessing any government help, you, when you choose a provider or you know, to help give you home care or when you go into a retirement village or when you choose a nursing home, they all come with contracts. Yeah. And you need to know the implications yeah. of those contracts. And most contracts differ. They're all negotiable. Yeah. I never knew that. I, I love no it. You've got 200 questions at the end of the book about what you should ask if you go into a nursing home. There are some They're really not all legal ones, they're quite practical ones, but 200 questions. I know. I thought it was, when I was researching, every time I went onto a, you know, a website page, it said, this nursing home, there are, four, there are five important questions you have to ask before you choose a nursing home. You know, every website, the five big questions. Then I spoke to someone who's a CEO of a number of nursing homes. She said, no, there's not five, there are 200. And I said, I don't want to buy the place, I just want a bed. <laughs> and then she showed me the questions and they were, I wanted to know the answer to every single one. Mm. And because there are very good nursing homes and there are shonky ones. Well, we've found that out, haven't we, over the last year and a bit? And, and during. Our inquiry. Yeah, and during. And the pandemic, of course, has shown that we don't have very good regulations over them because we've had people working there that haven't been properly tested and passed the virus on. You make that point in your book that a hospital has quite different regulation to a nursing home. Yes. And have you thought about nursing homes in the whole... I mean, you've been down this road so for so long. What would you say were the most important things we should be thinking of in the way we do elderly care in the future? I mean, you, you make it clear that there's a mishmash of bureaucracy cross-crossing each other. Um, 
have you, I suppose, is it too big an area for you to have a few simple thoughts about where we're going wrong? Um, no. Well, if we're dealing with the system as it is, and I'm not entirely convinced that this is the right way to go, but if we're dealing with the system as it is and, and, and in the, at the end of life, like most people now who go into nursing homes are in the palliative stages of their lives. So part of the question is making sure there's, there's trained palliative care specialists mm -hmm. in the, the, the nursing home needs to, to manage that. But I guess it's the expectations we have. A lot of people drop their elder off at the nursing home and think, that's it. Thank goodness they're in. They may be going fuel. Thank goodness they're in the hands of professionals who you know, know what to do. But you can't drop your loved one off. They will get their physical needs taken care of, hopefully, and, but, but their emotional needs, no one has the funding for that. Only 30% of nursing homes are for profit. Mm -hmm. The rest are not for, prof for profit. They're running on a really tight budget. They, there's, you know, most of the people who care for your parent are going to be assistants in nursing. They might be on $21 or $23 an hour. Mm -hmm. They might have a second job because no one can live on that. They might have English as a second or third language. They have so many responsibilities in the nursing home. They haven't got time to just sit and give all the care mm -hmm. and love. Mm -hmm. So you can't drop your loved one off. Mm -hmm. They can be there and live there. They can get their needs, their physical needs catered for there, their medical needs and their treatment. But everything else is still a family. And if you don't have a family, you, you speak about how many people in nursing homes don't have a visitor. Yes. You know, even you know, people who forget their friends. Yeah. Once you go into the nursing home. Yeah. Well, that was a that was a really moving story, and it really stimulated us to think of our own situations. Um, quite a younger person said to me his mum had got early onset dementia and had gone in to a nursing home, and it's just he and his brother and his mum. And then, but when she couldn't remember her friends, her friends stopped visiting. Mm -hmm. And that, he felt that was awful for his mum. Mm -hmm. And he felt it, it was a, he was, it was really sad, it saddened him. And I said to him, oh, well, it puts, you know, uh, more responsibility on you. And he said, no, no, it's not about my brother and I, it's about my mum. And it's about her friends still caring about her. And her friends still being interested in her well-being even if she can't remember who they are. And her friends coming, even it means they're not going out for lunch that day or whatever it was. Yeah, I guess it makes you realise what friends is really about. So what would, one, one of our members asked, what would you advise in, if you had parents whom you feel would be better in care and they haven't been able to convince them of that, what, what's a tip or some tips for approaching it if, if there's very little else? You've obviously managed to find a way in which they can be in a retirement village with help and whatever. Yeah, so they... Say you've got a parent who really can't be looked after unless they're in some sort of nursing home care. How's, what's the best way to get there? Well, make sure you choose... A, make sure you have a number of good ones that you've asked about. Ask the community, ask, you know, ask different organisations in the community about ones with good reputations because nursing homes with bad reputations they're known in the community so all the different services will be able to tell you that do your own research of course you take your elderly talk, take your elder um, with you and go and see these places and and talk to them about what they are and show them you know don't just drive them there and drop off and um, there's a whole uh, there's a whole process. In fact, I've written it down. I can't quite remember, but it makes it a lot of sense. Book. It's in the book. There's a process where you can keep um, taking, you can keep going and visiting places. Then, then you can say, well, this is the one we've chosen. Then, make sure you go every day. Have a wing person yourself. Like, look after yourself. Have someone you can immediately go home and have a glass of wine yeah. with, or bring them with you because the emotional. Um, you know, torture of a parent not wanting to be in a nursing home. Mm. But if it's a good one, most of the time it's better. They they are really happy in them. 
if it's a good one and you yeah, found exactly the right one. Like, and you someone dropped their mother off and was terribly worried and went back the next day and she was as happy as that. Yeah. Yeah, it can happen. It's a bit like a child in preschool. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, but you keep connected and you keep in touch and then if over a couple of weeks your parent hasn't settled, yeah, yeah. Then, remove, mm. then remove them. Something's going on. Try and work it out. But always... Um, when you set up their room, make sure you introduce them to all the stuff. This goes for in hospitals too. Put photos of them when they were young around their bed so that people who care for them go, oh, you know, this is Elaine. Oh my God, there she is, you know, mm. travelling in the 40s in mm. London. And there she is with all these grandchildren who've got written notes like, you've got to keep human, sadly. Yeah. Uh, it's really important to keep hum making you know them human beings. And You're introducing the full person to the people who are just part of the team, looking after yeah. them. They don't and know them any differently from the old person that's in no, the room. No, that's right. And then they know what they can speak about as well. And, and remember to write down things like, um, my, you know, my mother is really deaf. She hasn't got dementia, but she's really deaf. But if, and if she hasn't got her hearing aids in, she won't know what you're saying, and you may think she. She doesn't know, she's mm. lost her mind, but she hasn't. That's why this book is just such a Bible. It's all there. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> it's how to grow, you should have called it How to Grow Old. <laughs> <laughs> now you touch on euthanasia very briefly in the book, and one of our members asked, you know, if you don't mention it in the talk. Um, where does that come into all of this? I mean, we've had our big debates, and we now have various forms across the globe. But you do mention a few things there about how it can be possibly a negative, older women thinking they'll do everyone a favour if they go quietly. <laughs> yes, can you well... give me a bit more, more on that? Well, at first I was worried because I'd heard about a program called the Liverpool Pathway. I'd done a, probably one of the main reasons I s decided to embark on this book was not only looking after mum and dad, but I was doing a lot of palliative care conferences. I was emceeing them and I was learning about palliative care and end of life and I thought, no, I, we just don't talk about this. We don't know all this. We keep making mistakes and, you know, I, and even death and dying we don't talk about. And it was during one of those conferences that um, the Liverpool pathway was uh, discussed and that was a pathway that they tried at Liverpool Hospital where they thought, where I think they had amber light, green light and red light or something. Anyway, they decided to put old people who maybe weren't, you know, weren't able to be treated and cured of their old age. This is a medicalisation of ageing, which is another issue, which I touch on in my book. But they were put on this pathway. In other words, they were wheeled to some corner of the room and left to die. And some would take days to die, you know. This is all documented. And when the, part, when the public heard about it, there was an outcry and that was stopped. So when we started talking about this euthanasia, I was really worried about it. And also I'd read that, um, that in the uh, majority of people who choose euthanasia in, in Scandinavia are uh, older women who don't want to be a burden to their families. And I thought, like, what the hell? Is this a burnt shop right to the end of our lives? Are we going, I don't want to be a burden, okay. Mm. Uh, just end it. I'm going, what? You know, and I, it mm. felt fraught. There was a whole issue of the slippery slope. You know, who mm. else are we including? Can people just choose their own just when they're maybe going through? You know, with yeah. everything that everyone's heard about. And I was worried. And, and also being patron of Palliative Care Nurses Australia at the time, they weren't convinced either. But now, um, since Victoria did the, they're really they've got a very scrupulous mm. system. Mm. It's a lot of people think it's too hard line. You have to fulfill so much before mm. you are able to um, take your own to choose euthanasia. But at the moment, it's it seems that there. And from what I hear from the experts, I think it's a good. Um, it, works. it works because. What will happen is, as I said, at the end of life, you already, in palliative care professionals, give you the best possible life to the end. Mm -hmm. And they make decisions so that you're not suffering. Most people do not suffer mm -hmm. at the end of their life, mm -hmm. apart from suffering existentially. Mm -hmm. or, and some people do 
their existential suffering is way out of control and some people have got physical that does happen and those yes. people need to be able to choose they would need a lot of counseling too or help, help they need them. help and they yes and and sometimes the pain can't be managed mm. well, that's that's a big one yeah. that is a big one mm. sometimes for whatever reason mm. the pain cannot be managed mm. and then in my own case, I would want to yes. say, mm. I'm, I need it? to go, I'm t I'm, this is, I'm not happy. You, know? you have a good line, age can't be cured, only managed. Yeah. <laughs> and to some extent, do you think our problems with older people is that we forget that, we, we, we see hospital and doctors as always a cure now. We have such marvellous medical assistance. Is the problem that we just can't face the fact that we're going to die? and that when you get to a certain frailty, you can only make life easier. You can't stop it from ending. How much is that perception part of our problem? Yeah, I think it is. I think we've, you know, once you're using the word frailty, which is mm. really good because um, once, which is appropriate, and also there's a fantastic man, um, Professor Ken Hillman, who's written a book, A Good Life to the End, and he actually set up the first ICUs in mm. Australia, here in New South Wales. And he has written this book because he sees so many elderly people in ICU getting procedures and the medicalisation of, of ageing and getting procedures that they really don't, shouldn't have, that the repercussions are going to be devastating, that they're not going to be cured of old age. And he suggests that we start looking at this frailty scale. scale. And when I saw it, I realised that in the old days when I'd visit my grandparents, you know, you'd ask about some, someone or other and they'd go, oh, he's getting frail or she's getting frail now. So it was accepted and you'd see frail people around the street, really frail. Mm. And that, that frailty was allowed to, they happen. didn't try, allowed to happen. Mm. They didn't try to, to treat it. And the trouble is when, if you break something or you have a UTI, your parents will often end up in emergency mm. department where you get, where there's a set of protocols. The hospitals are set up to deal with acute illness, mm. to, to um, diagnose and treat and cure whatever mm. is the acute illness. But when you're old, you have all these underlying chronic illnesses and you have to be across what they are and know what they are in your parents. So, so you can say, well, okay, well, we'll treat the acute illness, but if you, you know, you, but, but we don't want to try and cure underlying chronic things with heart or lung because mm. it's, because the cure is going to be worse than that. Yes, it, the cure will kill you. The cure will kill you. Yeah. And it's not the way people don't want to be, end up in hospital. Mm. And, and I had that from, you know, personal experience. Oh, it's not a nice place to die, is it? <laughs> no, 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 it's not. And that happened to um, a close friend of mine. She she died and she had on her advanced directive, she had an advanced directive, and she said not to be resuscitated, but the advanced directive hadn't been shared with anyone. It, it, Nobody knew it, not the retirement village. It was with her accountant. That's when you said it should be tattooed on her chest. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> That's right, there's a lot of people, there's a famous photo, you know, in, not for real, in NFR, you know, on this That's elderly right. yeah. person. Well, I, I love this sentence where you said there are a few phrases as alarming as interaction with the government. <laughs> sometimes it evokes the image of waiting downstream for a glacier to reach you, and sometimes it's like trying to outrace molten rock lava down a hill. <laughs> now, your, ex your um, experience with the bureaucracy, whatever it might be, is excruciating. There's nothing like it that will Give us some tips about bureaucracy, because it's, it is excruciating. Just reading what you have to go through well, is excruciating. Can I read you out? Someone yeah, gave sure. me a list. It was his... his um, and oh, he's just... He was an accountant and he had to deal with um, Centrelink and he was just having, he, he anyway, when I said, he, he heard about me writing this book and he said, can I talk to you about my experience? And then he gave me this guide to how to deal, top, Ted's top tips for dealing with government agencies. And that's on page what? Page 26. Page three, not far in. <laughs> You're already there. <laughs> that's the top one because you are going to know. You are going to need to know how to do this. You know. So um, I can try and cut it on the run. One, have all your documentation ready. 
because you're acting on behalf of a parent. You'll need to, your parent to appoint you as a nominee for both Centrelink and My Age Care. You'll also need certified copies, certified copies of powers of attorney, enduring guardianship or enduring medical power of attorney. These should be certified by a lawyer and they need to be certified on every page, not just the first page. Get multiple certified copies because you end up needing tons of them for a whole pile of stuff. Oh, you're entering into a big business arrangement. <laughs> yeah, and you know, Taking over the HP. <laughs> uh, exactly. So that goes on different documents and the next one is don't rely on email my age care says they will respond to your emails within 10 working days one of ted's emails was not answered at all and another one took eight weeks to be answered set aside three set aside plenty of time for inquiries by phone an initial wait of 20 to 30 minutes is not unusual for Centrelink and you'll probably have to wait again for another 20 or 30 minutes if you get transferred and then the line may drop out and you'll have to wait yet again and you'll never talk to the same person so there's these guides keep records of everything like i said just keep detailed records of all verbal communications with centrelink and my aged care and all related agencies including the record of the date the time the person's name which will only be their first name their key recommendations and instructions and also the reference number for every call um, ask for form numbers like i said be prepared to wait if you escalate because sometimes you won't get any satisfaction from the customer mm -hmm. service mm -hmm. representative. So you'll have to ask to speak to a supervisor or the supervisor of the supervisor, but be prepared to wait again. Asking to speak to someone a little higher up the food chain is called escalating or elevating, but do it nicely. Make it sound like you know it's not their fault and that you don't want to kick the dog, you'd rather kick the dog's owner. <laughs> and be polite. It is also really important to avert any overt anger or sarcasm, no matter how you may feel. Hello, oh my God, you answered. I've been holding on for an hour and a half. <laughs> Do you mind if I talk? you talk to me while I pee? Just joking, that is the hose. <laughs> I'm washing the garden pots inside an echoing room, the laundry, uh, local canyon. <laughs> that was a dog. Woof, good boy. Flushing this out because <laughs> you will have. Uh, ask any questions if anything is unclear. Follow up. Don't be afraid to complain about your DHS experience. If you can't get no satisfaction, you can lodge a complaint with Centrelink Complaints. Here's all the numbers and and the address. If you still don't get no satisfaction, call the Commonwealth Ombudsman. Numbers, address. The Ombudsman will probably refer you back to Centrelink, but it will be given a higher degree of. Uh, importance and then finally if you are disadvantaged by errors made by Centrelink you may be able to obtain compensation through the scheme for compensation for detriment caused by defective administration and that's called the CDDA. Yes you make a big point in the book about the language used by lawyers and bureaucrats. Your parents didn't get to a home, they're not in care but they're in a retirement home and the whole book treats them with such respect, and I think uh, that is what I found remarkable. But um, Sophie asked a question about what would be your three main tips for handling your old, your old aging parents? Just three tips. Right, three um, tips. Three tips handling your aging parents as they approach that moment when they won't be with you anymore, and you've got to respect their their yeah. experience, respect their age, respect the fact that they do come on like a baby with a heap of wisdom. How do you do it? Yeah, Three well, tips. One, well, two of them I said in the in my talk, which is one, make sure that all conversations are with them at the centre and include them and their their wishes, their hopes, their fears. You must listen to all those. Really listen to. Um, what they're worried about and what they want and what they wish for. Get a notebook, write everything down. And the third one, I think just give yourself time with them. You know, just make, give yourself time to do all this. It's really uh, valuable, but you get a lot out of it yourself. Yeah. And. Um, and as you as you pointed out at the beginning, you know, I really wrote this for my children. 
It's for me. <laughs> the book. I think I'll do it myself. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Thanks, Jean. I hope it really does well. I think everyone should have a copy. Can I, may I just say something in defence of the young people? Because mm-hmm. uh, my daughter put this online on a, on a podcast called Shameless, and she said, "Oh, my mum. I'm really proud of my mum. She's just written this book." And it got something like 500 likes, and all these young people were going, "Oh my God, I'm going to buy it for my mum." That is really good. She's looking after her, you know, my yeah. grandma and yeah. grandpa. Every young person was so connected that with really the good. older people in their lives, with their elders. So we may be having a change, yeah, a I generational think so. perception about what we do when we get old. I, I really is, think so. Is, it was such a pleasant mm. sort of surprise for me. Yeah. I hadn't thought that they'd be like that, and they were. And I'm, and I'm very hopeful. One small step, one big step. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Jean. That's really good. Thank you.